In my closing speech, I'd like to draw together some of the threads of this debate to see if we can come to some conclusions. First of all, I think it's clear that this general consideration that Richard wants to raise about wouldn't Jesus reveal himself to everyone is a philosophical, not a historical consideration that is really out of place in tonight's debate. The point is, theologically, that God will judge people based upon the amount of information they have, and the resurrection of Jesus just has no direct implications for whether you believe in universalism or inclusivism or exclusivism. This is not germane to tonight's debate. What is germane are those four facts that I said are abundantly attested by the evidence. First, you notice that the burial account has never been questioned by Richard tonight. We have good historical grounds for thinking that Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus in the tomb. With respect to the empty tomb, my first argument for the empty tomb was the accuracy of the burial account supports the fact of the empty tomb, and Richard has never disputed that. Secondly, I argued that it's multiply attested in the pre-Mark and Passion story, in the special sources behind Matthew and Luke, in the independent Gospel of John, in the sermons in the Acts of the Apostle. This explodes Richard's idea that this is merely a literary creation because when you have multiple independent attestation of the same event, it can't be all coincidentally made up by all these people so that it exactly fits together. We have good grounds for uh, thinking that this is, in fact, a historical event. Third, I argued that the women witnesses lend credibility to the narrative, and he didn't respond to that. Fourth, the narrative in Mark is simple and lacks signs of theological embellishment. Here, Richard reiterates that the marking account is based upon Psalm 22 to 24. I think that holds no weight whatsoever. Remember Psalm 22, it's against literary borrowing because Psalm 22 says they have pierced my hands and my feet, and yet in the Gospels it never says that Jesus was nailed to the cross, or rather in Mark's pre-Mark and Passion story. Psalm 23 is not about dying. It's about being delivered from death which is the opposite of the crucifixion. And as for Psalm 24, as I already said, it says nothing about tombs, and especially Mark says nothing about Jesus being the king. If he uh, were copying Psalm 24, he would have said something like that. The phrase, the first day of the week, is not identical, contrary to what Richard asserted. It is different in the Greek. So there's simply no grounds for thinking that this is a literary creation based on Psalms 22 to 24. What about the Orphic mystery religions that he brought up in his last speech? Well, Richard gives away his case when he says, and I quote, Mark deliberately left out of his account everything in the Orphic narrative that he rejected and kept in everything that still had direct parallels with the gospel message, and then he changed the details specifically to convey how his message was different from the Orphics. This makes the hypothesis unfalsifiable and vacuous. The only motif that's left is the angel sitting on the right side. But in Judaism, the right side was commonly the favored side. So that shows no sign of literary dependence. Fourth, the Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. Uh, again here, the point is that Matthew is responding to a pre methean tradition that goes right back to the early church in Jerusalem and the disputes with non-Christian Jews. What about the origin of the, uh, or pardon me, what about the uh, uh, appearances Richard doesn't deny those, the origin of the Christian faith. Here he did assert that there was an expectation of a dying Messiah in Daniel, but I want to point out that Daniel 9, 24 to 26 was not understood as a messianic prophecy at this time. Rather, the Jews of Jesus' time would have understood the prince to be Antiochus Epiphanes, and the anointed one slain by him was the high priest Onias III in 175 uh, BC as narrated in 2nd Maccabees. So according to Jimmy Dunn, an eminent Jesus scholar, the most prominent and widespread expression of messianic hope was of a warrior king who would destroy the enemies of Israel. And yet the disciples came to believe in Jesus' resurrection despite those messianic uh, expectations to the opposite. Finally, what about the best explanation? Here Richard says, well, most bodies that disappear aren't raised uh, and therefore, it means the resurrection is improbable. Look, all that shows is that the resurrection is improbable relative to our general background evidence. But it doesn't show that it's improbable 
relative to the evidence of the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith. Relative to that evidence, I think the resurrection is highly probable, indeed more probable than all of these naturalistic explanations that Richard has attempted to offer tonight.